I want to introduce our moderator, uh, Ms. Gulnara uh, Kasambet from the BBC. She is a senior producer at the BBC covering Kyrgyzstan uh, and has been a journalist. Yes. She's been a journalist covering the region for uh, 20 odd years, and uh, so I think we'll be in very good hands. Um, and to open our proceedings, I want to introduce uh, the UK ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, uh, Ambassador Robin Ward Smith, uh, who happened to be in London, who graciously agreed uh, to introduce uh, Shams Kansamlaka this evening and this program. Ambassador Ward Smith uh, has is the UK ambassador to Kyrgyz to the Kyrgyz Republic, excuse me. Uh, since June of, of 2015, he served in a range of diplomatic uh, roles in Algeria, in Romania, in Germany, in Japan, in Iraq, and previously he was the UK ambassador to Tajikistan. So he knows the Aga Khan Development Network well, he knows the region very well, uh, and uh, I will now hand it over to him uh, so that he can introduce our program this evening. Thank you very much. Matt, thank you very much indeed for that uh, welcome. It's a uh, great honour to be here, and it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce my colleague and my friend, Shams, to you. Although I know that there are a lot of people here today who've known Shams for longer than me, so um, you will be able to add in the bits that I miss out. When I read Shams' bio uh, when he asked me to do this a couple of weeks ago, uh, I got onto the second page and I wondered whether I was reading the bio from two or three people because Shams has achieved such an incredible amount in a very distinguished career. Um, uh, as Matt says, I was previous ambassador in, in Tajikistan. That's very good to see Akbar again. Um, so I've had a lot of interaction with, uh, with AKDN, with AKDF, with the whole family um, uh, of the network. Uh, and uh, I have seen both the site um, in Horog on numerous occasions and now Narin as well. Uh, so I can completely endorse uh, the views about what, just what a great visionary uh, and extraordinarily important um, project this is uh, and how, just how needed it is in that part of the world. So um, my congratulations to all of you involved. But if I can just get back to the main reason why I'm standing in front of you which is to introduce uh, Shams Kasim Laka to you. Uh, Shams, as you know, is the diplomatic representative um, for the Aga Khan Development Network um, in the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, you probably already know that he is also an education expert. He's executive chairman uh, of the board executive committee of the University of Central Asia. He leads the planning and the building of the University of Central Asia. Uh, uh, and as you know, that was a project co-founded not just by His Highness, but by the three governments of Tajikistan, the Kyrgyz Republic, and of Kazakhstan. In a way, this, uh, this brings full circle um, Shams's work with UCA, because you were there many years ago, weren't you, Shams, uh, when you were negotiating the international treaty. Um, that, was, uh, that was signed in 2000 to actually establish UCA. Um, prior to that, of course, Shams, as many of you also know, was founding president of the Aga Khan University, uh, where he led the planning, the building, the operations for nearly three decades. Um, AKU, of course, also established by His Highness in 1983, campuses in Pakistan, East Africa, in the, and here in the United Kingdom. In addition to that, of course, Shams has uh, consulted for the World Bank, um, helped with the Nazarbayev University, I understand, with that. Uh, and, of course, previously, Shams served as uh, Pakistan's Minister of Education and Science and Technology in the caretaker government of 2008. Sorry, 2007, 2008. He chaired the board of the Pakistan Centre for Philanthropy, sat on the board of the International Baccalaureate Organisation, was a member of the board of the uh, Benazir Income Support Programme. He was also elected to the steering committee of the Toloya uh, network of 270 universities worldwide. He's a distinguished fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the <coughs> University of Toronto. He's written book chapters and articles 
on school and higher education, higher education reforms, philanthropy, civil society, management. He chaired the committee that wrote Pakistan's National Environment Protection Act uh, in 1997. He led the government task force in Pakistan in 2001-2002 uh, that recommended reforms in Pakistan's higher education that led to major structural changes in, in universities, creation of higher education commission, the doubling of access for students, substantial increase in research output, and a thousand-fold increase in funding. He was a member of the HEC from 2007 to 2011. This sounds like a very full career, but for 20 years before that, <laughs> Shams had been working in business uh, in, the, in the jute industry in East Pakistan uh, and in venture capital activities as MD of Industrial Promotion Services of Pakistan, sponsored, of course, by the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development. So he was leading a workforce of 22,000 and he built up one of the largest industrial and export houses of Pakistan. Uh, in terms of his own education, Shams did his first degree undergraduate education in, in, here in the UK, uh, and has an MBA from the University of Minnesota. Uh, he's received an honorary degree from McMaster's University in Canada, and he's quite rightly been uh, given national awards, um, both from the President of Pakistan and also from the President of France. I gallop through a little bit, um, but you will get a, you will get a feel uh, for Sham's being an extraordinary man um, who is rightly very, very well respected in Bishkek, um, within the diplomatic community, within the government and within the country for what he is, has achieved and what he is still achieving. This is a uh, very important year, of course, with the first students arriving in September in Narin. Uh, I have uh, absolutely no qualms, no doubts that it will all be very successful because of the excellent leadership that is shown and the very strong team that you have. Ladies and gentlemen, Shams. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. President of the Ismaili National Council, Chairman of the AKF National Committee, uh, Mr. Karaj and uh, members of the Council, members of the National Committee of AKF, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, Namdar Moki Sab, Kamriya Sab, and uh, all the volunteers who are really uh, very, very happy to meet the volunteers who've been serving, I don't know for how long, ever since I've been with AKU, these are the volunteers, and especially those who serve the coffee and tea and the lunches that we've had here. It's really wonderful, and I want to thank all of you for organizing this. Particularly, I want to thank uh, Nagib uh, Karaj and his team, and Matt, for organizing and, and inviting me to be here. Um, it's the first time, really, um, we are speaking about the UCA. Um, there's no reason we kept it under covers, but we were following His Highness's uh, advice that let the work speak for it. So there was no reason for us to speak about it until the work was ready. And now I think we are at the point where perhaps we can have uh, some more information for, for our, all our well-wishers. Uh, I also want to thank all the diplomatic uh, uh, core uh, 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 representatives here. I want to thank Gulnara as well for being here. It's, you've really done us a great honor by, uh, by your presence. Um, I also... Uh, want to uh, thank Robin Old Smith for this very generous uh, introduction. It's very kind of you. We have known uh, each other for a few months, but we feel as if we have known each other for a long, long time. And uh, once you are on the golf course with him, why, there's no way you can, you can ever catch up with him. He is one of the most avid golfers. He's a scratch golfer at St. Andrews. He's a member of the, of the club, so uh, you can imagine uh, what uh, new ideas and what excitement he brings to Bishkek, uh, besides his diplomatic uh, 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 prowess. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. 
Um, I, I just want to say one more thing because I'm a little bit emotional tonight because this is the, the town and this is the um, Jamaat where I had the honor and privilege of being a Kamariya of the London Jamaat. And I was a member of the council while I was a student in the UK. And that was in the 50s. So, <laughs> so I can see that some of you probably were not born at the time, but that's okay. We laid the foundations. It was a student Jamaat. And um, uh, we, we had terrific times uh, uh, with all kinds of uh, exciting uh, trips and, and uh, Saturday, uh, uh, what do you call it, socials in those days. That's what they used to call them. Dances and, you know, getting together, music, mayfil and so forth. So I, I just want to say how very happy I am to be back here. Uh, today, of course, our subject is the, uh, creating the opportunity on the, on the roof of the world. And the roof of the world is, uh, is where Central Asia is. Most of Central Asia in the Pamirs, in the Altai, in the Karakaram, in the Hindu Kush, in the Himalayas. That's the roof of the world. And so how do we create opportunity in this roof of the world? And that's uh, the subject uh, we will speak about a little bit today. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to do was to go through quickly uh, the, uh, the, the introduction to the Aga Khan Development Network. Uh, most of you have seen the big chart. I've simply put here on the, on the, on the left-hand side is the economic development arm, the social development arm, and the cultural development arm. And within the social uh, uh, development arm, we have the Aga Khan Foundation, the Aga Khan Education Services, the uh, Aga Khan Academies, and of course the two universities, AKU and UCA. Um, then we have uh, the spread of the Aga Khan uh, Development Network, uh, and it's particularly its uh, track record in education. You can see the red dots are where already AKU exists, including in this wonderful country. And uh, uh, in, in, in uh, the three yellow dots in Central Asia, the, 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 the background of this education uh, um, network is 100 years old. Many people often forget that it was really 100 years ago that uh, the schools were established, the first school was established in uh, Africa and Asia, and the uh, Aga Khan uh, education services and the academies and the universities put together, they have 216 schools in 16 countries and they serve 55,000 uh, uh, students. Now, so the University uh, of uh, Central Asia, uh, I think, owes, like many of the things that owe to His Highness's vision, and when he laid, when the foundation stone of the ceremony, uh, foundation stone ceremony of the university was laid in, uh, in Tajikistan, uh, in Khorov, His Highness's uh, uh, extract from that speech says, by creating intellectual space and resources, the university will bring the power of education and human ingenuity to the economic and social challenges of mountain societies in Central Asia and elsewhere. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the challenge that His Highness has posed us. It's very easy to write those five, six, eight lines, but when you unpack the meaning of that, it becomes very powerful, and that's the vision that's guiding the team that is, is, is working uh, uh, together at this time. I just wanted to mention that without this vision, uh, and, and the tremendous support we have received from the governments of, uh, from Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, the presidents of those countries, uh, we could not have achieved uh, what is at this time uh, the, the situation. So let's look at the context. The context is we have the Central Asian, and I'm referring basically to the main three countries where we are uh, functioning. We have the Kyrgyz Republic, population six million, uh, GDP $1,200 per, uh, per capita, and literacy rate, guess what, it's 99%. Wow, that's something that any country can be proud of. And what about Kazakhstan? Ooh, you have 17 million people, 12,000 GDP per capita, and 99.7% literacy. 
And then, of course, we have Tajikistan, which is not to be left behind. And that also has a population of 8 million, but the, the GDP per capita is 1,100. So there is a huge difference between uh, the, the, the Kazakh 12,000 GDP per capita and the, the Tajik one, which is 1,100, though literacy, and that uh, is about the same, and that is largely a, a consequence of the Soviet Union's emphasis on literacy, good health, opportunities for everyone. Very often we hear about the, the, the legacies of the Soviet Union, but don't forget there are some very, very powerful th contributions to human development. And that I, I always marvel when I, when I look at the outcomes in Central Asia. But then everything is not necessarily uh, measured in, and uh, development is not always measured in terms of literacy. You can make, put everybody in kindergarten and through primary uh, education, everybody is literate, but th where are the leaders going to be trained? That's the big challenge that we have. That's the big challenge, not just of Central Asia, but of most countries of Asia and Africa. So we look at it in that context and say, when we mentioned His Highness's statement about bringing education to mountain societies, the question is, why bring education to mountain societies? What was the compelling reason for this? Well, look at it. Uh, there is an inverse ratio between the height of the mountains at which populations live and their socioeconomic status. In other words, the higher you live in the mountain, the poorer you are. Inverse ratio. And why is that? You know the answer. When you live up there, you don't have enough pasture, your animals are not so well fed, you don't have seasons to cultivate, it's very cold, and it is far away from health, it is far away from education. So there is this inverse ratio which then results in marginalization of those populations. Marginalization. And by the way, what is the next thing that happens when people are marginalized? They become radicalized because they don't have opportunity. There's this risk, there's a potential for radicalization. And then uh, we have to engage with marginalized uh, or, or, or mountain societies so that uh, we have the, a university on the roof of the world, for example, in the hope of reversing the social, economic, political, and educational isolation. I don't think we are there to do any political or any development of that kind. We want to have the opportunity, give the opportunity to the people to um, reverse this uh, risk of marginalization through higher education. And then build human capacity to foster development uh, of, uh, and civil society. And education, of course, bridges the divide. And then what happens? Then there is a possibility that graduates uh, become job creators rather than job seekers. That's the purpose. That's one of the most important objectives. It's not easy. Not every university is going to be able to do it. I don't know whether we will be able to succeed. That's the objective. It may take 20 years. It may take 30 years. It may take less. Who knows? Maybe more. But that's the objective. So I wanted to just draw attention to the fact that if you look at Switzerland, two, three hundred years ago, the Swiss weren't the rich people of Europe. Hmm, what were they? They were mercenaries. You go to Lucerne, you find all kinds of monuments to people who were killed in battle, not defending Switzerland, but defending other, the Austro-Hungarian, the Vatican. And today, to this day, the Vatican has Swiss guards dressed in the old Swiss guard uniform because they were the mercenaries who really defended the Pope for hundreds of years. But then what happened? They got educated. They started getting into engineering. They started making watches. And those who couldn't make watches started making cheeses. <laughs> so every valley in Switzerland has a new cheese. And most of us have had the pleasure of you know, tasting a few of those cheeses. They're pretty good. And those who can't make cheese, then they have viande de grison which they, they, you know, they put the, 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 the beef uh, and, and air dry the beef, and that tastes very good too, particularly if it's with the cheese. So, <laughs> so this is how, and what happened? They discovered that this beautiful country, 
no different than Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan or, or Tajikistan or the northern parts of Pakistan or Afghanistan. They were tourist attractions. Where do you find these beautiful pastures? Where do you find the mountain flowers and the beautiful yaks and, and the, uh, the hiking that takes place in these mountains? And so when you have that, then the tourists come and those who stayed in the mountains and who were marginalized now have built two extra rooms so they can have two tourists come in and have bed and breakfast and pay them something. And Switzerland has stopped. Have you ever heard about migration out of Switzerland? Not in the, in the little while. But if you go to the United States, there are states in New England and in the middle, uh, Midwest where there are strong concentration of Swiss populations. Just like the Pakistanis came to Bradford, the West Indians came to Notting Hill Gate and wherever else, they have concentration of Switzerland. But that is now stopped. People are very happy to stay in their own country. By the way, that's the model we hope one day that we can bring to Central Asia and parts of that region. That's the, that's the, that's the objective. So building a university in Central Asia, we had the uh, a treaty of the university between the three governments and uh, uh, His Highness the Aga Khan. And in 2000, uh, rather in 95 to 98, the commission was established to study uh, what, what should this institution be like. We spent a lot of energy with our colleagues from Central Asia. Some very erudite and academic people contributed this, uh, their, their thoughts to this. And in 2000, the treaty was signed. And what happened there was that the treaty was then registered with the United Nations as an international treaty which gave the university certain rights that the countries gave it. They, uh, I mean, the, the investment by the countries is that they have given tax exemptions, they have given land at a very concessional rate, and sometimes almost at a, at a, at a, at a nominal rate in some cases, and that is their contribution, and the AKDN's contribution is now pull together the funds in order to build the university. That's not an easy thing, I can assure you. Uh, so we have here uh, the, the three campuses whose, uh, whose uh, designs architecture was uh, Arata Isosaki, a, an award-winning architect of Japan. All three campuses designed by this wonderful, uh, uh, renowned architect. And uh, our aim is to striving for international uh, internationally recognized standards of education and research. Research, please note research. This is not just education. We need to create knowledge in order to bring those job creators. We need to find opportunities, and that comes out of intellectual application of mind and creating research and fostering socioeconomic development of Central Asia in mountain-based societies and helping societies, very important, preserve and draw upon their rich cultural heritage. Hmm, rich cultural heritage. Central Asia, what is this rich cultural heritage? Wait a minute. Some of the biggest mines that the world has ever known came out of Central Asia, came out of this very region. You heard of Ibn Sina. You've heard of uh, Ibn Rushd. You have heard of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Ibn, uh, not Ibn Rushd, uh, uh, but also uh, Zohar. You have uh, heard about a number of writers, philosophers, uh, and, and uh, the people who have gone out who had scientific publications, scientific treaties. They discovered a lot about astronomy. They discovered the zero. It didn't happen just like that. What was that ferment that created it? And where is it missing today? That's the challenge His Highness has spoke to us. Study the past in order to discern, discern what we should do for the future. And one of the reasons we have understood, at least in our own little way, is that those were societies that were enlightened, where dialogue took place openly, where there was an inclusiveness, whether you were from Central Asia, you came from India, you were from Iran, everybody was welcome to come and, and uh, be at the court and the, the courts in those days, or the big uh, rich merchants on the Silk Road, they fostered poetry and science, and, and uh, in those days, the technology that existed. So 
uh, we have a situation that we have here preserving and drawing upon the rich cultural heritage. Believe you me, those of you who have visited Central Asia, you know how rich that cultural heritage is. And where is this uh, broad regional coverage of our university? All the, the big three triangles that you see there uh, are, I'm afraid this is not showing up, uh, right up at the top is the Tekeli, which is the campus in Kazakhstan, then coming down to Narin, and then there is the campus at Korog. All the yellow uh, dots are different universities that are working with the UCA in partnership, working in the Aga Khan Humanities Project, and also there are the pink dots uh, or pink diamonds where the School of Professional and Continuing Education is, is working as well. So what are we doing? Let's look at the scaling of the regional uh, university in terms of these timelines. The first thing that started was our School of Professional Continuing Education. It is now located in 11 places right across Central Asia. Six of the 11 are in Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan. Not easy. You know Afghanistan is not an easy terrain. It's not just mountains that's difficult. There are other things. And we are out there doing this. And to date, 85,000 learners have come out of the School of Professional and Continuing Education. So before the campuses were ready, people have been getting the benefit of this university. And that's the challenge Zainas gave us when we first presented the feasibility for campuses. He said, wait a minute, this will take you five years. It may take you 10 years, maybe take you longer. And once the graduate come out after four or five years, it will be another 10 years before they get into something that is productive. So what happens? And Central Asia gets no benefit until, you know, everything is ready. Think of the community. Connect with the community. And that's how we are now training mid-career professionals. We are training students to prepare themselves for university education. We are teaching Chinese. We are teaching Russian, English, financial accounting. I'll come to that in a minute. But the capacity building uh, of the university started a long time ago in 2007 when we sent 35 scholars out of Central Asia to do their PhDs in very, very many parts of the world, including this country, Russia, United States, Canada, Germany, China. And then we established our research institutes. Please note again the word research. Mountain Society's Research Institute in 1911, 1912, the Institute of Public Policy and Administration, one of the biggest uh, achievements of this Institute of Public Policy and Administration is the, is the uh, 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 training of Afghan civil servants. Almost all the mid-ranking Afghan civil servants in the Ministry of Finance, are they just don't let us go out. They said, you have to now establish your own campus here in Kabul because we need you, because we are very excited and we are getting benefit out of this. So then we have uh, the Narin campus that is opening this year and in 2017, one year later, we are inshallah opening the Khorog campus in, in Tajikistan and 2019, all going well, we'll have the uh, Kazakh uh, campus in Tekeli and then the first graduates will come out uh, in 2021, inshallah. Uh, so what are the current programs? I mentioned about the School of Professional Continuing Education. You can see the vocational and autom uh, automobile uh, uh, mechanical training. These, the teachers here are trained in Germany and, and uh, you know, computer systems of automobiles that teach this to the young people. And uh, then we have, sorry, uh, we, have the, uh, we have the cooperative called Zindagi where they learn all the crafts. They make furniture, they make doors, windows, and they make a cooperative. And they're supplying it within the, uh, the Gorno Badakhshan region of Tajikistan. You can see they're working together out of vocational and technical education. They've gone into their own business. And we have uh, also their construction activities. They have become contractors. We make blocks in our campus, in, in uh, cement blocks in our campus in Korog. They're, they're manufactured by these people. So they've got some, something to do. They've got a business now going, cement blocks. And here we have a man called Kalamo Faridun, who receives a, a certificate from our colleague, Dr. Krachenko, 
you can see the university is an inclusive place. You don't have to be having two legs in order to achieve something. And that's what we take a certain sense of pride. We give an opportunity to everybody. And by the way, this is the graduation ceremony, particularly with the Afghan students in here. Why am I mentioning this? Because there are students who come to Khorog from Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan. They spend three months, six months studying. And so what do they study? So I, I was there, and my colleagues are there in that photograph with all the students and faculty. And what happened was that we said, I asked some the, the young women who were next to me, I said, what did you learn here? You come from Afghanistan. What have you learned? So we learned a lot. I said, what did you learn? Tell me. He said, we learned to be on time. <laughs> oh, to be on time. So there is no rubber time, okay? It is, 8 o'clock is 8 o'clock. So what else did you learn? So we learned to respect one another. Wow. You take this for granted in the United Kingdom or in Europe or in other parts of the world. But in Afghanistan, this is not, this is unusual because everyone is for himself. Because circumstances have made people into that. I don't blame them. So education brings this opportunity to connect and respect. And I said, what else? So a teacher from the back said, and they learned hygiene. What a wonderful education. Women saying, we learned hygiene. Because one of the biggest problems in Afghanistan is primary care and health. Infection is very high. And mothers and children particularly are big sufferers. So I'm just telling you that the impact is not that we taught them English or accounting. It is much broader. And these are the young women. You can see them there. And then Aga Khan Humanities Project, which is, what is it? It is the development of critical thinking and writing skills within multidisciplinary humanities framework. Big words. Big words. 57 universities in the region are using this program which we developed to broaden the thinking, to become critical thinkers. And 11,500 students have been trained by 500 and odd faculty members. We have the Mountain Societies Research Institute I spoke about, and of course the Institute of Public Policy Administration, and then Cultural Heritage and the Humanities Unit. We have actually a unit which teaches people about their culture, promotes music, teaching of music. They go right into school, uh, uh, the classes. Three and a half thousand people in Kyrgyzstan are learning this music uh, from our programs. And of course, the research publications are all coming out as, uh, as we speak. So the undergraduate program is, of course, the capstone or the, or the jewel in the crown of the university, which is now being prepared. We are building only phase one of the undergraduate program because Let's learn and then go forward. Let's build and let's get some experience. So in Narin, when we are starting this year, we're teaching computer sciences, communications and media, and Central Asian studies as a minor. And in Korog, it is earth and environmental sciences. You heard about all these mudslides and, and uh, di disasters from earthquake. That's what we're going to teach, climate change, and economics. And the minor is a development studies. And in Tekeli, we've got engineering sciences and business management and globalization studies. And the language of instruction, hmm, you should be proud of this one. It's English. So we have a five-year program. Why do we have a five-year degree program? Because most parts of the Central Asian world, they have only 11 grades, up to Form 5, if I use a British term. So there's no Form 6. So if you want to give them international quality education, then we have to uh, prepare them to absorb that academic uh, rigor. And therefore, we train them for a whole year to become uh, educated to a level where they're now getting into university. And then, of course, there are four years uh, that uh, are just to, just to mention after that, we have a liberal arts uh, and general education in the second year then prerequisites for the, the, the majors that they're going to take, then the required major courses are, and the minor courses are in the last two years. And that's, the, of course, the graduation. Now, <clears throat> how do we get into a world-class education? Easy to say. 
But how does it happen? So the first thing we do is we are making partnerships with renowned universities, learning from them. How did you do it? Can you help us? Can you train our faculty? Can you help us develop a, a course? And so one of the first things we did, you can see we had an agreement with Seneca College in Canada for our preparatory program, the first program. And that's going extremely well. We are in dialogue with the University of British Columbia, with the University of Toronto. We have already made arrangements with the Higher uh, School of Economics in Russia and the school, uh, Stockholm School of uh, Economics in uh, Riga. And we are working with other institutions from a variety of places in this world so we benefit from know-how where it really exists and not just one source. This country, in Cambridge, we have a good arrangement and we are very proud of that agreement where some of our folks are being trained. And we have the global faculty and experts who come and we recruit them and we prepare them somewhere else. And then, of course, the liberal arts education is where we think it will broaden the minds of these young people. And we are, our selection and, and admissions in this undergraduate program is based on merit. And what do we mean by merit? There's a written test. And, of course, there are interviews. And then comes the potential for leadership that we have to assess and say, if this girl has potential for leadership, Maybe we should give her an opportunity because everybody has good marks. But the motivation to study and leadership are very powerful. We learned that at the Aga Khan University. It made a big difference when we put that into the equation. And of course, 2016, we announced uh, admissions and we have 522 applications for 70 seats. It should have been more, but for the first year, I'm personally very excited about it. And they are good strong candidates. We have already shortlisted 204 of them. And there's a strong competition from all three countries. There's application from Pakistan. We have application from Afghanistan. And uh, by the way, what will it cost? It's going to cost 5,000 for tuition and 3,000 for room, board, laptop, library, sports, everything else. And that's 8,000 annually payable in your national currency. We are not asking them to pay in dollars. That's, they don't earn in dollars. And the fees are benchmarked against uh, other high quality uh, regional institutions. So we are not an outlier. But believe you me, 8,000 is not the cost. It is at least four times that much. Who's funding it? Hmm. Who funded this center? Hmm. <laughs> so we have here financial aid. Of course, our aim is to diversify that. His Highness has said, I will take care of a particular period. He told us at AKU, first five years of losses, I will bear. Then you tell me when you're going to recoup. And then when, when you're going to recoup, and when am I going to get back that money? Because then I can plow it back into the university. I remember when he said that to me, when a single brick had not been laid. He said, I want to see the cash flow. When are you going to break even? And when are you going to recover money? And I said, 11 years before we repay you the money. In five years, we break even. Believe you me, half my hair I lost because of the first five years. <laughs> so merit-based scholarships are given. And there are needs-sensitive grants. People who don't have the highest merit, but they are needy. They're, they're orphans. Maybe they come from poor families. And then we have interest-free student loans. These are not one of these interest-bearing loans. There's interest-free. There's a very small service charge, but the, uh, the, the loans are interest-free. And, and then uh, up to 90% you can have of your fees of 8,000 paid by the university if you have a deserving and if you can prove to us that you are the deserving candidate. And financial need will not affect admissions because which is solely based on merit. First, we admit them, and then we ask them, have you got the money? How can we help you? How, where, where have you heard this happen before? Well, that's one of the objectives, His Highness said. Nobody should be denied education because they don't have the ability to pay for it. Believe you me, this is very difficult. Now, quickly, we look at the campuses and their settings. This is the Tarin town where we are building our first campus. Look at the mountains. Look at that valley. There's a river running through that. And that's the first phase of our campus, which is uh, the, this is the academic building here in the U-shaped. 
the other three buildings are dorms and this first phase by the way is part of this whole master plan look at the big master plan that is going to happen in four phases and this is the status of the Narin campus in July of 2014 22 months ago and this is the status uh, today in 22 months and so let's quickly run through this this is the entrance of the of the academic building the classrooms the faculty residences I can already see some people saying well maybe I should become a faculty member over there <laughs> and by the way these are student dorms ah now there we go so here is a faculty uh, lounge terrace overlooking the beautiful river and the mountain this is how we want to trap our faculty <laughs> give them the opportunity to perform and give them the attractive surroundings and of course the student lounge and the library this is just the first phase and classes begin day one in Narin campus 8 a.m. 5th of September that's a date was fixed two years ago so, so you can see this is the result of collective work it's not Shamska Simlaka it was not my idea to build this university I don't do the construction our job is to be the orchestra you know we got the orchestra we got to lead that and of course this is Korog town again you can see the valley similar and in Korog we are building uh, again phase one of this uh, of this campus with those uh, white buildings that you see over there and this is the way the the master plan is and within which we have this little section that we are building and this is how it will look when it is finished by the way where we are now we were in May of 2015 one year ago we were in this condition and in May of 2016 it is this we don't let any grass grow under our feet over there so classes there begin oops they're not going to begin <laughs> September of 2017 this is our objective and uh, then we have the tech elite town campus which is the whole campus and the red sections are phase one of tech elite and this is how it looks and then what is the socio-economic impact of this when you build a building like this at the university we have in total Narin campus 85 million Korog 95 million and technically this is 105 million dollars that will be spent and what will it achieve job creation economic impact of this will be 1800 construction jobs are each campus has 600 construction jobs in a place that's depressed there are not jobs and 98% in Korog, for example, most of you know where Korog is in Tajikistan, 98% of the workers and 80% of the engineers work from the town and the oblast of, uh, of uh, Gorno Badakhshan, right? The local people. And 40% of the works packages were awarded to local contractors because they won the, the contracts. We didn't give them because they are local contractors and there's 300 new faculty jobs and staff jobs will be created and job creation and economic impact of the university will be 350,000 jobs uh, 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 you know the, the days of employment have been created secondary employment we estimate to be 750 million generation of economic activity look at the ripple effect and of course there are examples I'm running out of time so I will not spend too much time on this maybe we'll catch up but Samat Khalidul-Doyev is a contractor that didn't know much about building. He became a small sort of built the walls and things like that. Today is one of the contractors out of our university's uh, work. And here is a wonderful example from Narin. This gentleman, uh, uh, Jackie Poy Chubak, he was a small egg, time, egg farmer. Uh, you know poultry farmer he had maybe two dozen uh, chickens and he said to our school of professional and continuing education I want to join your entrepreneurship program so they said fine come along join this is the fee he paid it and eventually he learned uh, about doing a you know business plan 
And then a part of our study is send him to Bishkek to see how other poultry farmers do it. So 15 days he was there. He learned how it is done. He came back. And what this Jackie Poy did, he spread the word with his friends. All right, you keep some chickens and you keep. And before long, we had a cooperative of chicken farmers. And all the chickens and all the eggs that we eat on our campus in our welfare facilities are all coming from Jackie Poy. Here is actually the impact taking place. Uh, and uh, here is the man, the person on the, on the left hand side is uh, Hafiz. Uh, Hafiz is an engineer. He was not an engineer. He was working in the AKDN office as an administrative guy. But he always wanted to be an engineer. His family could not afford it. So when the AKDN office saw that he had this capacity, they sent him to England to do project management. And before long, he became involved in the Korog project. And today, he's the head of the Korog construction, building $95 million of construction. He's supervising. He's from Korog. I mean, how can you, how can you not uh, you know, admire what these people are doing? Look at the grit. And then, of course, uh, we have high quality employee welfare facilities. We got very nice canteen. By the way, canteen is run by a local uh, you know, uh, Jackie Poy's friend who <laughs> buys the eggs and chickens from him. <laughs> so you remember the song which says they are laying eggs now. So that's, that's creating a multiplier effect. And then we take care of our, our workers, their blood pressure, they're sick, and we've got a nurse on board, doctor. Uh, so there are, uh, beyond the campus there are things. That that's very important. I want you to see this that we've just reopened a family medicine and diagnostic center in Narin. It has got all the facilities for x-ray and uh, all the tests plus endoscopy. There's no endoscopy equipment in Narin, entire oblast. So the, from the day it has opened, there are seven to eight endoscopies every single day. And that's the benefit that the community gets because His Highness said, look, it is no good having just the university. We do something for the people. The people can also benefit out of it. And so we have the center. We are proposing to build a university in, in, uh, in Narin and, of course, Korog. And there will be housing facilities that we are proposing for the faculty where they can live outside the campus. Uh, and the town people can also participate. And early childhood development is a, 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 about to be started very soon. And we are renovating a park inside the town. This park is a beautiful, it, it was a very torn, you know, it, a very shabby park. And we are investing, we're bringing plants from 60 different species from outside of uh, the town and bringing them in. And so just to conclude, you will see this is a, st a quote from His Highness's statement at the first graduation of the medical school, where he says, al Oxford, Heidelberg, and Harvard are in AKU's bloodlines. But it is strongly influenced by its times and its location. That's the first university His Highness established. All of you know about AKU, right? And I have to tell you that the bloodlines are now coming into UCA. So you have the AKU on the left-hand side, UCA, inshallah, the same uh, bloodlines that His Highness referred to of scholarship and curiosity and development, they are now coming into UCA, UCA and thank you very much for...